Okay, good morning, everybody, and can I welcome you to the 25th meeting of the Education and Cultural Committee in 2015. Can I remind everybody to make sure that they switch off all electronic devices um, and keep them off throughout the meeting. Um, moving on to uh, agenda item one. Our next item is an evidence session on Skills Development Scotland, which is the last session on examining the spending decisions made and the outcomes delivered by some of the key public bodies within our remit. Um, can I welcome to the committee this morning Damien Yates, Chief Executive, John McClellan, CBE Chair, Katie Hutton, Deputy Director of National Training Programmes, and Daniel Logue, Operations Director, all from Skills Development Scotland. Can I welcome all of you to the committee this morning? Thank you for coming along and giving up your time. Um, I believe you wish to make a short opening statement. Well, one of you does, I hope. John. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chair, and good morning. I we're pleased to be here today and to have the opportunity to contribute to, to your important work. In our recent submission, we provided a comprehensive overview of our work and an outline of our corporate plan to 2020. And I'd like just to highlight a couple of our goals. One is that we want to ensure that employers are better able to recruit the right people with the right skills at the right time. We also want there to be opportunity for all and for people to have the, op the appropriate skills and confidence to secure work and achieve their full career potential. In short, our ambition is to see Scotland's economy fuelled by a highly skilled workforce, with each one of us able to contribute our talent, skills and commitment. Our staff seek to deliver this ambition within the framework of our skills planning model, which follows a systematic approach to skills planning and development. Working closely with industry leadership groups, we gain a comprehensive understanding of current and future skills demand by industry sector, by region, and those we respond to with skills investment plans and regional skills assessments. These plans include critical actions for our learning systems. Annually, Scotland invests nearly £7 billion in schooling, further and higher education and work-based learning programmes such as modern apprenticeships. It is therefore vital that this substantial investment is aligned with the needs of Scotland's people, its businesses and its economy. The Skills Investment Plans are helping do that. We really do want to make skills work for Scotland. Another very important part of doing exactly that is our own daily work in schools, where our dedicated career professionals help young people build their career management skills and inform them and inspire them to choose the right careers. And in our 47 customer-facing locations throughout Scotland, we provide careers and skills support for all people, regardless of age or need. Where skill needs are particularly urgent, we develop and implement interim measures, such as skills academies. The recently established Digital Skills Academy is, a, is an example of our responsiveness. That urgency is also evident in our leadership of a group of agencies working in PACE, where our staff are physically on site within hours sometimes even prior to the formal news of potential redundancies. At Skills Development Scotland, we are never happy with the status quo and take pride in our innovations, such as our online services, My World of Work and our Skills Force. This natural tendency to innovate is also evident in our recent securing of funds to deliver enhanced career guidance to younger school pupils, pilot new foundation and graduate apprenticeships, and given that equality and diversity at the very heart of our work, do even more to drive change that will make an enduring difference for those at risk of being marginalised. Everything we do is characterised by partnerships, engaging directly with individual employers, employer bodies and 17 industry leadership groups. We also work closely with every local authority, have partnership agreements with nearly 400 secondary schools and membership of every CPP or one of its committees. We also work closely with the third sector, trade unions, Job Centre Plus and, of course, our sister agencies within the Scottish Government. We are sure this commitment to partnerships will stand us in good stead as we now seek to make substantial contribution to the shape of the newly involved and integrated employment service in Scotland, which I am sure is of great interest to the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for that statement. I am just going to move straight to questions from members. I am, and we are going to begin with John Pentland. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning. Uh, in 2014-15, the main focus in the ministerial letter to yourself was to see what activity you would do to meet the national outcomes. 
and how you would respond to the recommendations from the work of the Commission for developing Scotland's young workforce and the importance of partnership working with relevant bodies. Could I perhaps ask to what extent is a, does SDS is able to influence the priorities set by the Scottish Government rather than simply being the delivery vehicle for the Scottish Government? On to that. Um, one of the areas we spend quite a bit of time looking at is best practice and what works well both in Scotland and elsewhere. So I could give a number of examples in terms of policy areas that we have, I think, had quite a significant influence on uh, actual implementation and, and plans going forward, and specifically in respect of developing Scotland's young work workforce. So probably three areas. The first would be in, in careers advice and guidance. Um, we have shifted significantly in the last number of years away from a notion that careers is about a simple choice at a point in time to one which is about building the skills, the career management skills of young people, recognising that in the future they'll typically have up to 14 different career paths uh, in the first 10 years of their working life. So the ability to migrate and jump between jobs and progress is really, really crucial. Um, that work was embedded within building the Curriculum 4 as part of uh, uh, the Curriculum for Excellence. Uh, and as part of that, we then made a strong case to the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce about SDS doing a lot more work in early years so through that, we've secured funding to support young people from P7 to S3, uh, and specifically around subject choice and the degree to which subject choice can be supported in making much better career progressions thereafter. The second area of work, which is quite transformative, is around work-based pathways. Uh, the committee may be aware that it has been a significant shift over the last 50 years in progression into the workplace. So if you were born in 1958, there's many of us around the room who'd remember that, uh, you came out of school in 1976, then back in those days, if you were 18 in 1976, 74% of people went directly into the labour market with a wraparound skills programme and typically apprenticeship or professional apprenticeship type programmes. Fast forward to 2013 and it's just about 20% of young people are going directly into the labour market. The vast majority are going into FE and HE. And so there's a sense that somehow or another, as we look ahead, there's a bit of a disconnect between the choices that young people make uh, and the world of work. So we're currently trialling through the Developing Scotland's Young Workforce new work-based pathways. So what we've proposed to Scottish Government is, is during S5 and S6, young people, in addition to core hires, would undertake the first year of a modern apprenticeship. They would have a sponsoring employer and the employer would take them through on-the-job and off-the-job training over S5 and S6, and that this would have really beneficial outcomes. At the minimum level, it would have the outcome of helping in the young people who have a, a view about a career path to actually experience that job and be in the workplace. If a young person wants to progress in an MA, then it should allow them to progress into year two. Um, and if they want to go to university, we've got examples where the University of Strathclyde are now saying that if, if the chair of a convener of the committee has got his higher maths and physics but has done higher geography, and I've got my higher maths and physics but I've done the first year of an engineering apprenticeship, then I'll get in before the convener to Strathclyde University. So the tariff of the work-based pathway has both very strong academic tariff, but equally it's got very strong work-based tariffs. Now this work was based on research we did right across the globe in respect of economies that have very strong work-based learning programs. So I, I won't continue, I guess there's two good examples for work that we have done to influence policy going forward. Obviously the, the money you receive from the Scottish Government has got to be used in a strategic direction. How do you uh, answer that and, and how do you report that? So we would report that on quite a number of different levels. Um, clearly we align all of our outcomes with the National Performance Framework. We specifically support about eight of the indicators in the National Performance Framework, so indicators around the confidence and learning capabilities of young people, um, uh, successful transitions from schools, uh, the acquiring of qualifications and having a skilled workforce, uh, supporting young people and those in the workplace to progress and secure jobs, 
uh, major part of the apprenticeship programme, and responding to large-scale redundancy programmes, ensuring that those who are under threat of redundancy can positively return to work and sustain uh, their careers beyond that. So right across the suite of the national performance indicators, we've mapped exactly what we do to contribute to those. Beyond that, then, we look at what are we doing in respect of our own programmes, um, we undertake both internal and external evaluation of our own programs. We report on the activities that we deliver. We report on the impacts that transpire out of that. So we can tell you that of the you know, 26,000 apprentices that we would support every year, we've got completion rates of between 74 and 78 per cent. That's amongst the best that you will get in any work-based program. We've got sustained employment at 92% six months beyond completing the program. So we can report extensively both on internal measures and external measures in respect of the investments that we deliver. Yeah. Obviously, much of your funding is, uh, comes from Scottish Government in, in, uh, through grant and aid. And uh, could you perhaps tell us uh, to what extent would Skills Development Scotland is able to generate other income, uh, other income streams? There's probably not too many areas that we could uh, actively look at developing income streams. One area that has emerged as, as a case of international best practice is around the, the use of my world of work. So we've had uh, interest from New Zealand from Wales, um, from Norway, in respect of uh, the ability for those nations to acquire the uh, infrastructure around my world of work and deliver a similar service. We're actually in advanced discussions with the Norwegian government about potentially transferring that expertise and looking at a, a reciprocal relationship there. Um, but uh, with those areas, it would be very difficult to uh, identify areas that we would generate income specifically. Probably just one final question, Convener. Uh, could you perhaps advise the committee uh, the reasons for the in-year transfers of funding to SDS from Scottish Government in both 2014-15 uh, and 2015-16? What specifically are they? The reason the in-year transfers? Yes, yeah, so typically um, we would get a grant in aid at the start of the year and then um, uh, at uh, autumn budget review or spring, spring budget review we would tend to get additional income based on commitments against our priorities so pretty much it's just the way monies come to us to deliver our services they come at the start of the year in respect of grant and aid and then they come by way of top-ups through abr and sbr um, but that's the method that we get our money okay um, I think, to be fair to, to John, his question was, you know, why is that the method? What are the reasons for then your transfers? I mean, you know, you get to around 180 odd million, um, and then the rest is in, in your transfers, or most of it. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, a matter for Scottish government. It's that's how we would get our money. So I, I'm not sure. I couldn't answer that. I mean, that's to do with Scottish government. You, you've never had any discussions or engagement with the Scottish government or officials about the way that your money comes to you. Yeah, we regularly do, and. and you know, it's more a, a directive to say you will get this money through grant and aid and you'll get this money through ABR or SBR. And it will depend on the type of commitments. So, for example, um, typically the ABR and SBR is for maybe one-off spends. So we may get uh, spends in respect of support that we got for the digital and ICT sector to support the response that government would have to that sector. So we would maybe have a one or a two-year uh, uh, funding cycle, but it wouldn't be part of our core grant. It would be an exceptional additional amount that would come over and above grant and aid. Since then, sorry, John. Just sort of following on. Yeah, sorry, I thought it was more technical. No, but does that type of processing cause you any problems? Um, you know, if, what would happen, for example, if the government didn't agree to give you the, the additional money? Well, if we had already made commitments uh, in respect of investments and they were legal commitments and that money didn't come through, then clearly there'd be an issue of, of liability in that respect. So that's never happened. Uh, we've never had a situation where government hasn't been in a position to honour the liabilities that we have that we've set out. Okay. Um, Mary, Mary Salmon. Thank you. Um, 
The Audit Scotland had a report in March last year on modern apprenticeships, and uh, you were in front of the Audit Committee, of which two members here, including myself, were also members. And at that time, we were uh, quite intrigued as to, you know, looking at the background of the cuts in college funding, the huge cuts in college places. And at that time, we were really very, very concerned that only 10% of college of apprenticeships were trained through uh, further education colleges. So when I saw your uh, grand plans today, I looked through and I was expecting to see maybe 20 or 30 per cent of your modern apprenticeship training going to further education colleges. However, instead of 10 per cent going to colleges, it's now eight. It's getting worse instead of better. Now, given the quality standards and the robust testing and inspection regimes in colleges, uh, why are you giving them less modern apprenticeships than you did two years ago? I'll ask Katie maybe to give a, a fuller answer, but just to say to the committee, any provider, whether they're a college or a private training provider, who today would have the opportunity to provide a level three apprenticeship in a STEM area for a 16 to 19 year old and who can deliver against a 74 to 78% completion rate and a 92% retention in employment six months after, we will guarantee that we will fund those places. So whether it's a college or a training provider, we will guarantee that we can deliver those. Okay, so I'll maybe just... ask Katie to... Just that the colleges did bid for 44% more places than they were allocated. It's in their briefing. So it's quite a significant amount. <laughs> Um, colleges are a valuable partner in the delivery of modern apprenticeships. There are direct contracts with colleges and, as well, there is an indirect contract through um, other providers who subcontract part of that um, to colleges themselves. Um, I think the, the key thing here is that we, we operate a procurement approach to this which is open and transparent and it's competitive. And every single provider, whether it's third sector, private, college, etc., are treated in exactly the same way. And a key determinant of that is um, around things like achievement rates in terms, of, um, in terms of a measure of quality. And also, did in the previous year, did the providers deliver what they said they would set out to do? Because, you know, it's quite a balancing act getting all the numbers um, in terms of achieving the 25,000 target. So, for instance, colleges, who I, I do think are, 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 you know, are great deliverers as well, sometimes you find that with some of them, not all, um, that you find that the employer links are there. We've had lobbying from certain colleges during the year to up the numbers, and then you find that they've been handed back at the end of the year. That can sometimes happen. Um, and also, we have some feedback from provide, um, employers from time to time who will say things like, well, the mode of delivery isn't flexible. So, but the main thing is it's a, a market-based approach, it's competitive, and they're treated exactly the same way. I would say also that the foundation apprenticeship um, model, which has been developed by SDS and moving forward, will see a greater role played by colleges because they're the main delivery agent for it too. So you may see that that is a methodology of gaining greater employer contact when the young person is at school, and then that continuing when, when they, they progress on to their um, modern apprenticeship. So given that you've both mentioned achievement rates, is there a problem with colleges? You know, what do they have to do? They're bidding for... They get 8% of your work. They bid for 44% more than that and don't get it. Is there a problem with the college's uh, achievement rates? You did mention flexibility, and I do understand that one. But is there a problem with the college's achievement rates compared to the private sector? In some cases, yes. And it gets down to looking at the, the achievement rates relating to the different frameworks that are available. That's not the case across all colleges, and you can't generalise. You have to look at every single bidder that's bidding and judge them on the basis of, as I say, in terms of their achievement rates and also whether or not they deliver to the contract levels previously that were given. And as I say, a number of providers, not just colleges, can let us down in saying, you know, I'm going to have 50 engineering places and then you find they wait to the end of the year and then they hand, hand a lot of them back. So we, we, we just can't have that, which is why we manage our contracting process very tightly. Right. The other uh, point in terms of operational activity that came from the Audit Scotland report, um, they were very critical that your performance measures didn't look at uh, whether the apprenticeships well, were value for money, but it was also the link between national outcomes. 
Uh, not clear if there was details of the number and types of apprenticeships needed to meet employer needs. Uh, and also the Wood Commission in the same report said that modern apprentices, apprenticeships needed to be better aligned with government priorities and skills priorities in order that people can get jobs. Um, what have you done in order to ensure that modern apprenticeships are aligned with employers' needs and government priorities in economic growth? Yeah, so a, a couple of responses to that. One would be to say that... Um, all of the work that we do through our skills investment plans to understand the future demands of key sectors, and we now have 10 of those, look specifically at the stock and flow of skills through apprenticeships for their education college and, and universities, and specifically ask the question, have we got enough flow in the system to meet what we anticipate the future demand to be? So we've got specific uh, shifts in the apprenticeship programme to respond to that. A good example was recently we had year-on-year -year increases of 500 apprenticeships into the energy sector at a time when the sector was in growth. So that responsiveness is built in. In terms of the long-term evaluation, I think the recommendation from Audit Scotland was to ask Scottish Government to have a look at the longer-term uh, impacts of the programme. And so we have engaged the OECD in, in this work. And strangely enough, there are few countries in the world who do long-term evaluations of the outcomes of investment in, in work-based learning. Uh, so we're right at the start of agreeing a framework with the OECD. We've uh, uh, funded a PhD student to work with the OECD and ourselves to put in place the longitudinal studies that will track the long-term benefits for the participants, for the participating companies in terms of uh, those who engage, for industries and for the economy. So we'll be able to provide Parliament with a comprehensive set of econometric and social data that underpin why you would invest £75 million a year in a programme like the Apprenticeship Programme. To be quite honest, the econometric longitudinal OECD study that we'll all be sitting here getting very excited about seeing you were asked to bring something forward two years ago, and what you're telling me today is you're going to start looking at longitudinal <laughs> econometric. So can I just ask, that, given that you've answered this question, that you're now doing what uh, Audit Scotland uh, asked you to do, and they were very critical about you not aligning modern apprenticeships with, with jobs, which is what we all want to see, um, what have you done in particular on uh, IT and computing, given that there's a critical national shortage? And given that your careers advisors are in schools, what have they done within schools to ensure that pupils uh, get the qualifications that they need in order to go on to do HNC, HND I'll degree? ask Katie to come back on the evaluation question in terms of what we do here and now today. Uh, and I'll then come back to you on the ICT and digital. Well, I asked you questions two years ago, so I'd like a bit, you know, I don't want jam tomorrow. I'm asking questions. I'm looking for a, a follow-up on, say, March 2014, rather than two years' time longitudinal studies. As regards to the long-term economic metrics, we have actually been working in the interim. I mean, it takes, I don't know if you've ever worked with OECD before, but it actually takes quite a bit of time to work with them, to put forward a proposal, etc. The other things that we've done is working with government around the nirvana of this whole thing about long-term evaluation is actually to do it in a way that's cost-effective. It's very, very expensive to survey people, as you'd appreciate. So there was a We've been working closely with government. There was a bill going through Parliament about access to things like HMRC data. And Mr MacArthur, the last time, said he was a bit concerned about that. It would be anonymised. But what you would do is you would use all the publicly available information to actually match data together. We've been other, we're developing a new system also for um, modern apprenticeships, which will also match the data that's sitting in things like the careers guide, uh, the careers um, databases as well. So we've been doing an awful lot on the, the infrastructure that's required to support long-term economic, economic evaluation. The other thing um, you asked specifically about was IT. Since um, the big jump from 20,000 to 25,000 apprenticeships from 9,000, from 910, the um, other services, which is IT frameworks, has jumped by 1,000% in terms of the number of starts. Um, and it represents about 15% of the growth that took place from the 20 to the 25,000. 
specifically on the ICT, so we completed the ICT skills investment plan with industry, which looked at the future demands of the sector, predictions that we'll need 11,000 jobs year on year over the next five years, uh, largely made up of replacement, but some with new and additional, identified what are the critical areas, and the critical areas tend to be in support sectors like in finance, uh, creative industries, and so on. Um, we've uh, co-financed through support from Scottish Government the establishment of Code Clan, which is a, a very specific programme to retrain uh, individuals who have got a, a STEM or a science background into being skilled workers over a 20 to 26 week programme. So it's a very rapid programme. It's been established as an industry owned academy. Um, and so a lot of work will be done in terms of responding to that now. Our chair engaged in discussions with the funding council and John may want to comment on that. I think, I think it's fair to say that I, because of the demand for ICT skills and having spent most of my life in the ICT industry, <clears throat> I can probably say that the industry itself recognises they have a role to play in this, uh, both in the context of being involved in skills academies, also in helping us, as they have done in, in arriving at the, the right forecast for skills. I, and candidly also helping us uh, attract young people into their industry. Uh, so we, we have a real push in terms of more college places, more university places, more apprenticeships, but also a, a significant effort being placed on encouraging young people to pick up and take up the opportunities that uh, digital offers. I, and not only through our career centres and through our schools activities, but also through a major campaign, a marketing campaign, you might call it, I, and I, both in print and in TV. I, we've seen some quite, quite significant interest, even in the last few weeks in that, in terms of people taking time and taking more interest. So it's very, very clear that the combination of having the, you might say, the learning provision available, I, having a knowledge and an awareness of the demand, very, very important, but also what we need to do with industry, with us, uh, is to encourage more people to take an interest in this particular area. Question, uh, convener. Well, I have to be honest, and we get so many reports at the Audit Committee, NHS 24 and various others, and uh, uh, IT in Scotland is at a critical, critical level of demand for people. And I had hoped that even with national fours and fives this year, that there might have been an increase. Uh, however, 29,000 fewer school pupils did national fours and fives. There have been falls in every single STEM subject. So whatever the promises you're making, and these problems have been highlighted to you in the past, uh, I think you know, longitudinal econometric OEC studies in a few years' time is not going to do it. So my final question is, it's also very disappointing that disabled modern apprentices in Scotland remains at 0.7%. Uh, I'm sure my colleagues would all agree that we would like everyone in Scotland to get the opportunity to do a modern apprenticeship, 07 and that compares with 8% in England. Now, they don't always do things better than us, but if they can manage 8% of modern apprenticeships to disabled students, why can't we do a bit better than 0 0.7? Okay. Um, we've done a lot of work with stakeholders and looking at available evidence on the whole equalities um, um, subject. Um, <laughs> The issue around disability is there's a focus early on with people about what they can't do that, and, and their stakeholders talk about you know, negative stereotyping, particularly in the labour market. And one of the big issues around that negative stereotyping um, is the University of Edinburgh report shows there's a real fear of rejection if you disclose your disability. Um, people lack confidence to do it. Um, and there's a lot of unconscious bias, which um, all of us um, are party to as well. So our figures are actually self-declared. Um, we, if you look at the quarter one statistics, it's actually taken a jump this year to 3% um, in quarter one of this year. Um, we use the Equality Act definition in um, 2010, which the comparison to England is not, is not comparable because they use a much wider definition of disability. 
Now, we've done some work in this and we looked at matching our MA start database with um, details that we held of in individuals in the career in the career database that we hold, our, our individual database, and we think we're actually in the range of the annual population survey, which is at 8.1%. So a lot of it is about disclosure. We believe that why we've had an increase in the numbers disclosing this year is because of the training that, we, that we've um, undertaken with training providers about helping around disclosure and other measures we've put in place too. The other thing that's happening at this moment is because of this definitional issue that's out there with other agencies using different definitions, etc., we have um, engaged the Qualities Challenge Unit to a respected organisation who do this thing across the UK to agree with stakeholders and other parties to investigate the whole issue of definition and they're due to report later this year. Um, the other thing that they'll be doing, and this is what stakeholders tell us is, is, is as important as the definition, which is to identify the strategies that help individuals freely disclose that they've got a disability so they've got the support they need. If I could tell you that studies show you that even university students will disclose this freely at university but won't disclose it when they go into the labour market. Okay, thank you. Chick. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I wonder if I just let me come back. I was going to ask a question about training providers, but I'll come back to that in a minute if I may. Uh, John, you, you just talked about ICT, the question that Mary asked. That doesn't sit easily with the, answer, the, the submissions by the games industry, for example, in Scotland when we he brought them before the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee to talk about the creative work and the, the opportunities that we had. So I hear what you say in terms of engagement, but there is evidence perhaps to the contrary. The other thing that I'd like to ask is, is a, a, and Damien will know about this, in, in terms of we have a crisis in the heavy goods vehicle industry, 11,000 drivers short. How do we engage, I mean, on the basis that you engage through third parties, but how do you assimilate the need with the supply as you see it, not just on a, on a national basis, but on a regional basis? I mean, the HGV thing, and, and I've been told that, uh, that my request for members' debate is, is being approved to discuss this because it is an absolute crisis. I mean, how does that fall through the net? Let me, let me comment, first of all, on, on ICT, and then let Damien, Damien will talk about the transport industry. Although I think there are parallels. I, and and I, I made the point earlier that uh, what our thirst for knowledge on skills demand has demonstrated, I, and our skills investment plans show, is that very few industries, I, in fact, very few employers, really have a long-term view of what their skills needs are. And, and that's a really relevant uh, point when it comes to acting when you, when you know and when you, when you need skills uh, and the lead time. So there is absolutely no doubt in, in a, number of, a number of industries, uh, you know, construction is one where the construction industry lost a lot of people uh, some years ago. And now we're back in the situation having to try and catch up with what the skills need. In the ICT industry, uh, the demand from particularly young people for courses, uh, the interest in the industry itself waned, fell off. In fact, at one point in time, just a few years ago, courses were being, the number of courses were being reduced. So I suppose the point I would, I, I would make is that we are very much in catch-up mode. I, and, and but we, we are catching up, but we're very much still in, in the mode of, of responding and trying to provide more places. The Skills Academy, Damien mentioned, one opened in Edinburgh, another one to open uh, soon in Glasgow. These are interim measures, but to some extent they recognise the lead time involved in producing, for example, computing graduates or digital, or digital skills you know, through the conventional further and higher education routes. And very, very important... I also is the point that I, that was made just a few moments ago, and it's very important that I, that I, pupils, in, in a schooling sense, receive as much support as possible, I, in, in the context of an understanding of digital, I, I, and receive some sort of computing training or education as they move through their as they move through their their school years. 
So we're much in catch-up mode, and there will certainly be industries, and there are some we know of right now, and certainly ICT is one of them, where the skills investment plan is in place, but it hasn't caught up yet with the demand. Yeah. Before, we, before we move on to transport, um, I heard what you said about catch-up, but what does SDS do? Look, look, surely it's, it's not good to be catching up. It's better to identify the problem you know, as it approaches you rather than wait till it passes you and then try and catch it up. I mean, effectively, what do SDS do to identify upcoming problems such as the one you've just been discussing and then deal with that problem before it becomes a situation where you have to catch up? Okay. The, the interesting thing about this is that until we launched our skills investment plans, that there was no formal mechanism for collecting and understanding the demand that industries had or would have in the future. As we embarked on the very first of these, and one of the very first was, was energy, it was very clear that what we were looking for and what we were collecting was information that was very often not available. So we are in catch-up to some extent because the industry is in catch-up, because the industry didn't forecast, the industry had perhaps you might argue no mechanism to inject their demand into, which we have now provided. So it's a, it is an industry, and there are others where there are peaks and troughs, I, and there was a trough for a while. Uh, it's taken off again quite significantly, and, uh, and we've done our very best to be as far ahead of it as we can do, but undoubtedly the industry, ourselves, the nation, I didn't recognise that, uh, in the, looking, looking forward to the current years, there would be such a high demand for ICT skills. I think it's a point really worth making that workforce planning generally is not that good. And actually, if you were to look at manufacturing and the supply of a component, you'd plan well ahead to make sure you had that component. But somehow or another, the UK in particular is alone amongst the OECD countries in the degree that it doesn't plan ahead. And there was a great example of that in, in the early 80s. The oil and gas sector switched off the majority of their graduate and uh, training programs. Huge disinvestment in, in the early 80s. And then when we had the recent upturn about four or five years ago, you couldn't get a chartered engineer for love the money. Now, it takes 14 years to get a chartered accountant or a chartered engineer. So you reap what you sow. If you don't invest today for the future of tomorrow, then you know, skills don't sit on the shelf. There's not people waiting there for the market to upturn and jump out and be ready. And similarly with the ICT sector, the downturn happened on the back of 2000, the dot-com crash. There was no big recovery. All of a sudden, there's been a recent recovery. Industry did not invest in looking ahead to see how they were going to invest upstream. And, and that disconnected between industry and its investment in the future workforce should be a very specific subject of this committee because when we look at countries like Switzerland, remarkably different. So Switzerland, 8 million people, probably one of the best quality of living in Europe. 90% uh, of their GVA is from export markets, high value markets. 67% of young people at the age of 15 start their senior phase in Switzerland as paid apprentices. The apprenticeships are designed, validated, and delivered by industry, 130 industry boards. Uh, the young people have contracts of employment in senior phase. Uh, the colleges deliver that curriculum on their license to industry. And the alignment between the future needs of industry and their investment in those needs is absolutely one. Uh, the opposite is the case pretty much in the UK, where industry sits back and waits for uh, uh, those skills to come. So, what we're trying to do is to plug a gap. There has been an absolute gap in, in that information. I mean, the idea that the Scottish Government would invest £1.7 billion in further and higher education, and we have no demand statement from industry, begs the question. And so we have come in and filled that gap, and it's one of the great advantages of a new skills agency being available is that we're calling that out. And we're working intensively with industry to say, look, help us understand what this demand is going to be. And even in asking the question, we don't get great answers. So it's actually quite a difficult thing. And so we now have 10 sector plans. We've got 11 regional plans. Uh, and we'll get better and better at this. But I think part of all of our role is to challenge industry to say, look, you need to look ahead and we need to co-invest 
to ensure that Scotland is producing the talent that's going to drive the economy forward for the future. And the question on transport? Uh, Katie, maybe. Um, yes, I mean, you, you know that the, the industry has a number of issues. I mean, things, there's legal issues around what you can drive by what age, etc. Um, also, there's insurance issues as well, too. And in terms of poaching within the industry as well, that's that's been part. part. 15, the MEA programme can make a contribution to it, certainly, and 15% of all starts last year were in transport and logistics. And that's gone up from 19 by about 22%. Um, you know, we met with the Rotology Association and Transport Scotland and, and um, you know, we pointed in the direction to, to a range of things that they could do in terms of trying to assist the industry. Um, you know, there are things like um, good case studies in school now with AD Logistics working with one of the Lanarkshire, working with GTG and the schools around developing a national progression award at school okay. levels. Mm -hmm. My question was, how did that fall through the net? Well, I think, as, as Damien said, it's not as if industries are particularly good at predicting what their needs will be in the future. And that's why the SIP process comes into play. And um, you may be aware that, for instance, we've been talking about having a skills investment plan for, for the transport sector. And we had, um, we've developed some work around that, which has been the rotology industry are are happy with that and now it's sitting with Transport Scotland and we'll be moving on that quickly. So there are a number of things we can do, but we are relying on the industry themselves identifying what their needs are going forward. We're encouraging them to do that. Um, I wonder if I can come back to training provision. I mean, I don't know how many training providers there are. I mean, I've talked to some in the construction industry. How do you, what due diligence do you perform on the training, provider, training provision companies? to ensure that they uh, will do what they can do and that they're you know, financially robust to make sure that they, 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 you know, there's no hiatus in terms of the, the provision. Yeah, OK. So um, we do a number of checks um, on the, um, the providers. Um, and we have, um, in terms of the invitation to tender, for instance, we've got 11 mandatory questions on that. And, you know, that will cover a variety of things like criminal convictions, have they ever had contracts terminated, etc., health and safety, conflict of interest. We also do financial checks on first um, too as well. And then during the contract, and once that's fine, if they get a pass or fail, if anybody fails any of those questions, then they don't get a contract. During the contractual year, um, we have in place a range of measures. Um, they, have to f they have to complete a statement of quality assurance, um, a statement of assurance of controls that they send to us. Um, we go out and we visit um, the providers concerned and we, we use a risk rating for that to make sure that, that, uh, that we focus on the ones that we think need a bit more work with them. Um, we've got a compliance team that checks and um, that assures the payments that are made to providers. And if you remember, our payment methodology is very much back-ended on achievement. It's not all up front. Um, um, a very, very small percentage is up front. It's only for 16 to 19 year olds. So we have got a range of measures, which also include um, speaking to the customers, which are the apprentices themselves and, um, and the, the employers as part of that too. We, and the survey work that we do too. And, and we also relate that back to where, where the, what training provider is. So I think we've got a range of measures um, to actually ensure that our contracting and contract management and working with contractors is robust. Okay, so there's no you know, major gap where apprentices might, <coughs> might find because of the lack of diligence by a training provider that their, their training is impacted. Yeah, I mean, for instance, if a training provider decides it no longer wishes um, to offer a service, then we will uh, put in place um, measures to actually scoop up those trainees, con um, get other training providers involved and ourselves in terms of, of continuing their training with other employers. Okay. Uh, if I may, one last question. Okay. Um, we have a rather regrettable situation in the steel industry just now in terms of, um, and, and we all have different views on how that might be recovered, but you lead on the delivery of the PACE programme. Yeah. Can you actually you know, walk me through it quickly uh, as to how, what role you actually play in the whole PACE project? Because you know, I think it's quite important some of us think we understand it, but it would be uh, quite instructive as to how you marry up those who might be redundant with skills, and particularly on a local basis. 
Yes, yeah, so we coordinate the program on behalf of the Scottish Government. Um, typically, we try to look ahead um, at situations where pe companies may be at risk rather than actually going through the redundancy process. Um, very close engagement with the enterprise agencies in respect of co-vigilance and who might be at risk. Um, if there's a certain situation where there's a closure, um, we get in as quickly as we can. We find that if we get in in advance of people leaving the workplace, that on, on average we get about 70% back into uh, positive transitions. Um, what we find is if the workplace shuts and people disappear uh, and they get maybe payoffs or whatever, then the ability to get, get to them and give them good advice is, is significantly diminished. And a lot of effort then is spent on trying to track them down and, and offer that advice. <coughs> But the advice covers a number of, of different areas. There's clearly the technical advice in terms of um, what they need to face into in respect of payments and all of that. But then very quickly we move into skills analysis around what are the core competencies that an individual might have and where might there be in the regional labour market the types of jobs that they could swap into. Um, now that could be various. Um, I'll give you an example in respect of the Energy Jobs Task Force, which is, is quite a good one. Um, over the last six months, we've organized three different events um, where we've invited those at risk of redundancy in the oil and gas sector to attend an event. But what we've done is we've brought up to 40 or 50 employers to the events who are looking for skills in very similar sectors. So the first event that we ran at Pedodri, we had over 850 people from the sector come to an event, which was an amazing turnout. Um, but a lot of... Uh, those individuals immediately connected with the likes of Scottish Water who were looking for process engineers, uh, folk at Dun Ray, uh, people in the pharmaceutical sector, people in the whisky industry, all of whom had lost process and fluid dynamic type engineers to the oil and gas sector as it, as it grew. Um, typically, we will case manage thereafter, so when we meet with somebody, we'll register them on our careers database, and we will then try and follow up with further support, both in terms of either acquiring additional skills, so if there's uh, what we call transition skills that are required that might take somebody from a particular sector to another sector. Um, we did that in respect of Code 6 welding for the NIG yard previously, where we did rapid uh, upskilling uh, to uh, new industry set standards. Uh, we'll do CV preparation, we'll do job preparation, and, and we'll follow through as quickly as we can. Uh, depending on the scale of that, then we work very, very closely with our uh, colleagues in DWP, Job Centre Plus, with the local authorities, and with anybody who can add value to uh, supporting the, uh, the process. The position with the steel industry now pretty much is around retain rather than retrain, and so at the minute we're on a watching brief in respect of, of the steel sector, so we are not mobilising at the minute in respect of retraining just now. I think all of the efforts are around trying to exhaust the possibilities of retaining that sector and retaining those jobs. Um, but right across the piece, um, there's a very, very strong engagement across all of the impart partners to ensure that all of us are as responsive as, as we possibly can be to the very personal and difficult situation that people find themselves in. And for some, that can be the first time maybe in 30 years that they've been faced with that situation. Uh, and having a direct contact with somebody from SDS or from one of the partner agencies to actually sit down and work through what are the next steps really, really important. So uh, it's really critical. The, the early engagement we find, the earlier that we can get in and the more progressive that uh, businesses have good industry relation policies where they actually believe they want to look after their workforce and so are willing to allow us to get in and engage with, the, with their staff, the better. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got two supplementaries, one from Liam MacArthur and one from Mary Scanlon. The point sorry, to, sorry. To, yeah, I got Liam first and then Mary. Sorry. I, in fact, I was, thanks, Kevin. I was, I was going to follow up a couple of points that both Mary and, and Chick had, had raised. I mean, I noticed in the, um, uh, in the corporate strategy that there appears to be a, a diminution of the, the, uh, the, the goal of working together. And actually, the, there seems to be an absence of any mention of goals and, oper in the goals and operational objectives of, of schools and colleges. And I was listening to the, the, the exchanges there in relation to ICT. Uh, college places were main, uh, mentioned, training places, universities, job opportunities. Um, 
Uh, I mean, frankly, what we've heard um, in, in other evidence is about the uh, severe reduction in the numbers doing ICT in our schools, um, the, the, the problem in recruiting uh, teachers. And I think the concern I would have coming through from um, what appears to be a change in tone or emphasis within the, 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 the goals and operational objectives is that SDS is focused on um, the demand and the pool from, from industry and is perhaps um, slightly less concerned about what is happening directly in schools, where the, yeah. the pipeline of, of, of pupils coming through is going to be clear. And actually, in terms of job opportunities, the risk is the teachers that, that we do currently have in, in schools are attracted away. And there was a particular problem in relation to um, uh, computer programming. It's not just broadly ICT, as I understand it. Computer programming is a particular uh, problem in terms of bringing young people through. Um, and, and without that emphasis on um, the, the provision in schools, the providing in, in colleges and, and, and through training providers and universities and even the job opportunities is going to meet with limited success, presumably. Uh, ju just a couple of points, and I'll maybe ask Danny to come in on, on specifically on the schools, but just in terms of the partnership working and the supply side, be absolutely assured that we... We are intensive in our engagement in terms of those partnerships. So we have f over 400 school partnership agreements with every secondary school in Scotland. Very little of what we do, we deliver independently ourselves. It's a necessity that we're heavily engaged with schools. And in respect of schools, it's not just directly in the schools. It's with both the parent-teacher councils and with the parents themselves. Because when you look at the influence on the choices that young people make, it's actually Parents are number one, teachers are number two, and peers are number three, and careers advisors are actually number four. So more of our effort is increasingly spent on getting the messages across to parents and teachers about the information that we're providing in terms of future demand, because stimulating and inspiring young people to aim for careers in growing sectors is absolutely what we need to do in respect of... I include helping schools address the recruitment whether it's a crisis, it's certainly a significant problem, the recruitment problem they have in terms of... So the, I guess there's two parts to it. One would be the direct management of the school curriculum delivery would be a matter for the schools. It wouldn't be a matter for Skills Development Scotland. But we can support through the industry engagement. Uh, and so we have shown that through Apps for Good and a whole range of STEM-based programmes that we're able to leverage industry into the schools to add to the direct teaching capability and to support the process of inspiring young people. And we've done that uh, with the school environment as well. So we've got a strategy with uh, the Glasgow Science Centre where my world of work and the, the relationship between having a science experience and what are the careers beyond that is connected. So we're both in the schools, we're working with the Parent Teacher Council, we're working with the National Parent Forum. We're, um, we've currently got a, a massive uh, a campaign through the Nutshell um, uh, communications tool that the National Parent Forum have to uh, highlight particularly the ICT and digital sector and the opportunities that are there. And so uh, then specifically when we look at college and, and HE, all of the evidence that we produce informs the outcome statements for further and higher education college. A really good example in energy, we funded the establishment of the Energy College Partnership, where at the time 43 colleges said we're all expert in renewable energy, but we actually said, no, we want to work with a smaller network of those who actually have the distinct competence. And so we had the example of uh, Carnegie College and, and Dundee College uh, transferring their capacity down to Dumfries and Galloway in respect of overhead linesman technician training. Uh, and so we have a network of now 10 colleges who are very specifically capable in delivering the supply training for the, for the uh, renewal work around the Bewley Denny line. So the supply side is absolutely critical. And maybe ask Danny to touch just a bit on the schools. Thanks. Uh, just in addition to, to, to a couple of points to mention, we've referenced the skills, the sector investment plans and the regional skills assessment plans quite a, a few times today, and the, the importance of them in terms of the intelligence that gives not only our own staff in terms of being aware of where are the, the jobs of the future, the skill sets that are, that are going to be required for that. What we've been doing, and Stamien's mentioned, we work, we've been working extensively with the various parent-teacher forums to get that information over to parents in terms of information. Now, that, that particular communication to parents is not something we're going to see happening from traditionally from S4 at that transition stage. We're talking all the way through, all back through early years and in primary schools to raise awareness at a much earlier stage of opportunities, what's there within the curriculum. And the recent launch of the career education standards 
there's been a significant development in terms of looking at what's actually taught within careers education called I can, I can statements, can do statements. So those have actually been introduced as part of the 3 to 18 curriculum. So you're trying to get that information much, much earlier in terms of how we communicate that to, to young people and to, and to parents. And equally at the same time, we're working very closely with teachers, and that's around looking at some of the, the capacities around what they are teaching in the curriculum. If you look at building the curriculum for particular skills for learning life and work, and particularly the work dimension, how do we see the, the, the whole issue about labour market information in careers, the whole career education standards permeating subjects? So it's not a bolt-on or an addition to what a young person will experience in the curriculum. It's part of the curriculum, and it's integrated within there. And a couple of other points I think it's really worth mentioning about the key role for employers. We're working very closely with schools, with local authorities and with employers to make sure they're actually more built in and referenced in the curriculum. That's where career education standards come in. But there's a number of initiatives going on through Learning Through Work Week, for example, is, is imminent. And some okay, members of this committee will probably be involved in hearing about Learning Through, through Work Week and be involved in visiting some of the schools where employers are getting in with their modern apprentices and talking about what opportunities there are available in the labour market. With Scottish Apprenticeship Week coming up in March, and again, raising awareness of all the opportunities that are there. There's a big uh, digital skills campaign that's actually on just now about raising awareness of opportunities in, in, this, in this particular case in terms of digital skills. There's a lot of, of, a lot of information, a lot of intelligence there that we actually want to make sure, as Damien said, to get through to the key people who influence the young folks, young, young people, whether it's, it's parents, whether it's teachers, and it's their own staff as well. Can I just pick up very briefly with um, something that Katie Hutton was saying in response to, to Mary's questions in relation to colleges? And we've obviously been through a fairly uh, radical process of, of reform within the college <coughs> sector. Now, um, each of us taking uh, various views on the way in which that happened. But nevertheless, one of the um, uh, defining objectives and rationales for doing it was better aligning colleges to the needs of, of, um, of, 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 of industry and, and, and of our economy. So, I mean, I, I think it is more than a little surprising that we're finding that there's a drop in terms of the provision uh, of apprenticeships from 10 per cent to 8 per cent. I mean, is this a reflection of the college sector's been through this process of, of reform and therefore the expectation would be going forward that this will get back to the 10 per cent and, be, and beyond? Or uh, I'm, I'm struggling to understand why it is that we've gone through this process at some cost to the, to the sector. Um, with the result that they seem to be less able um, to att attract the, the, uh, the sorts of work for which they are wholly geared up. I mean, except they're not the only ones geared up to it, but they seem to be in a worse position competitive uh, to this pro procurement process than they were before. There are always fluctuations in terms of relative share because it's a competitive market and it can change from year to year depending on employer demand. Remember that that, that 8 per cent also builds on the subcontracting that they do, so they're much more involved in the ME programme than that direct contract. Some of them prefer to do the subcontracting role rather than a direct contract with ourselves. But 24... But he pointed to the 44% that the, they're applying for. So, I mean, in the sense that yes, maybe a lack every, of appetite among some. Ms McAuliffe, I could say to you, every provider overinflates what they can actually do. We get, we get, we get busy. And you, you know that, that when you look at the previous year, they've, they've, say they've delivered eight engineering MEs and they're bidding for 100. And they, they delivered eight and they were given a contract with 20. So, it usually, we, we look at that in terms of what their previous um, allocation has been. I think, you know... Every college is different. You know, some of them have really have increased, some of them have gone down, and we've got big college contracts out there, um, some over a million pounds as well. But that's for direct contracts. There's also the indirect contracts. And as I said, with foundation apprenticeships and the pivotal role that colleges play in that, I think you will see that. But I could see the see the, the, the greater employer connections also come that way. But I couldn't prejudge. I mean, this is a competitive process, so it would be unfair of me to prejudge any competition next year, too. I would, I would say though, that I think your, your question is, is right in the sense that the direction of travel will be more alignment. And I think in time, more of what the very good colleges do will become the norm. Uh, and the difficulty between the direct contracts and the subcontracts is that for the direct contracts, you need to have very high quality employer engagement because you're responsible for delivering the jobs. Because remember, every apprenticeship is a job. It's not just the delivery of training. And for some colleges, that's a great thing because they've got really, really good industry engagement. Uh, for those who haven't had the history of that, they find that challenging. Through the regional approach, they all should have 
good strengths in employer engagement. And I would, I would predict in time we would see quite a growth in that. We, we had a re meeting, re meeting recently with a number of chairs of, of the regional colleges and, and we had a good discussion around uh, that alignment and around the investment in work-based pathways and, and very much the question that you, you, you've pointed, which is the colleges are very well placed to be a key bulwark in the delivery of work-based pathways. Uh, and certainly I think the Foundation Apprenticeships, for which we hope to have 20% of senior phase pupils undertaking work-based pathways alongside core subjects by 2020, then I think the colleges will have a, a majority role to play in that delivery. So I think the trajectory will be up. Yeah. Mary. Thank you, Convener, for letting me in again. Um, it was the point you made to Chick Brodie about, now I'm in favour of private sectors, I'm in favour of colleges as an ex-lecturer, but what I'm most in favour of is a high quality uh, training for young people that can get jobs. But in the Audit Scotland report, under quality assurance, and I quote Convener, uh, apart from colleges, and I quote, there are no equivalent independent reviews of the quality of training provided by other, including private, training providers. Now, if you're not independently reviewing the quality of training providers, and we all know the inspection regime around colleges, are colleges missing out on the basis of cost? Because I don't believe... Uh, that it's on the basis of quality. Are you going for the cheaper option? Is that what it's about? It, it's certainly not a cheaper option because it's the same contribution rate irrespective of which trading provider is involved. And I just say that um, since that report, um, we've been working with Education Scotland about the application of um, their inspection regime to the whole of the MA programme. And today is the first report is coming out today and it's on engineering. That involved colleges, but it also involved private providers and the scores were excellent and very good. So that has actually... So that's the first forward. time that you are independently no. reviewing... So an independent external inspection as regards what Education Scotland does. But remember, the Audit Scotland report also pointed out the quality assurance procedures that we have in place. Also the quality assurance procedures which the accrediting bodies have in place for, for um, individual training providers to be awarded learning centres, accredited learning centre status too. I think it's a, a, a point. Are the private training providers reviewed independently in terms of the quality of training in the same way as our colleges are? That's the question I want to ask. Is it equal, high-quality training from both? And is there a system that... Because it wasn't in place last year. Audit Scotland were, I think, specifically referring to the Education Scotland regime... What was then put in place was um, um, apply, apply that to starting with the engineering sector. And as I say, that's happened. And the enge engineering sector report is out today on the Education Scotland website. So it's just starting? No, that, but we've put... Well, they had to develop an approach to... If you also remember, Education Scotland... Could I just a finish? A clear that? answer. Oh. Well, the Education Scotland... Um, also would point out in their college inspection regime, they didn't specifically single out modern apprentices too. So that was also a gap in the, that inspection regime. So this is the first one focused on modern apprentices in terms of education, Scotland's work. But as I say, training providers were also held to account through other quality assurance measures. Just a very quick question on the back of what Mary Scanlon has been asking. Um, obviously, this is about... Uh, getting young people ready for the, the world of work and getting modern apprentices and, and upskilling the workforce. Is there any difference in outcomes of people who have went the college route for doing their MA or going through private training providers? Is, is the outcomes in terms of the percentage that, that successfully pass, is it the same levels or, you know? I think, it's diff I think it's really dangerous to generalise about different sectors within, within the provider base. So there'll be some colleges where the achievement rate is lower than relative to third sector providers, councils, companies themselves, etc. So you would have to look at it in terms of, we tend to do it on a framework basis. So you look at engineering across the board when you're allocating the engineering places, etc. So it's, 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 it's differences and you'll get some who are higher, some who are lower. 
Um, before bringing Colin, can I just check something? You, you, you raised it earlier, Damien, and you mentioned it again there fleetingly in uh, the response. And it's about this idea of bringing um, in year modern apprenticeships to S5 and S6. Um, could you explain a little bit about that and when that's coming in? Or when, what, yeah, I, mean, so I mean, S5 is a very extremely busy year for pupils in school. I'm struggling to understand how you'd have an in year modern apprenticeship on top of an S5 curriculum. So, <clears throat> There's something about broadening what we consider success to be. So at the minute, it feels like success is defined in terms of quite a narrow academic definition. And so for many parents, success is Sally getting her five A's and getting her place at university, and I've done a great job. And for many people, that's not a clear pathway. For a lot, it is, but for many, it isn't. Um, and the discussion we had with the Commission for De Developing Young Workforce was is the senior phase a very productive uh, phase for young people? And when we look at the subjects they take and the experiences that they have, I think you're absolutely right, Convener, that S5 is a very busy space. Is it busy doing the right things, though? Um, and for most people, whether they're going the academic route or the non-academic route, they will have two or three core subjects that they want to pursue, and it could be English, maths, physics, or whatever. And what we see is increasing number of students taking what we might call make-weight subjects. It's not subjects that they've got any great ambition in. It's not subjects that are necessarily uh, aligned to the career path that they're going to go, but it's subjects that will give them an academic tariff, uh, an easier academic tariff than their core subjects. And some of what we're trying to say is, look, if, if you run your core subjects alongside the work-based pathway, and if in time, because this is part of a development process, if in time we can get the same academic tariff for the work-based learning, and the work-based learning would be the on-the-job and the off-the-job training that's a core component of the framework training as part of the apprenticeship, so that that equates to the equivalent of a hire, then you get the return on that for the effort that you've put in. But better than that, you get direct experience of the sector that you're interested in, um, you switch on either, you know, uh, is this a sector I want to pursue or not pursue? Now, what, we've got a whole range of, of pathfinders. We started with um, two last year. We're going to have 19 this year with, with 19 different local authorities. We're looking to offer them in five key sectors where there's sectors in high demand, health and social care, engineering, construction, um, ICT and digital and so on. We think the rump of the work will be done at different points depending on those pressures. So some schools run an asymmetric week, so Fridays are available for some of that work. Some schools, example in Shetland, are running the on-the-job training over summer holidays, so that young people are incredibly motivated to do the on-the-job training, so they're doing it at a time where those pressures aren't so significant. So it will really depend on the volume of academic subjects they're taking over S5 and S6 and the degree to which the school manages that. But it shouldn't put a huge burden on, on the young people. But better than that, it should produce an outcome which has got very, very advantageous uh, uh, benefits. What we found is, is that um, for those young people who've taken the, uh, the first uh, pathfinders in engineering, that the motivation back into their core subjects has increased significantly because they have begun to see the, the relevance of why they're studying, what they're studying for, and what the pathway might look for them. I'm trying to understand it. Is it envisaged that it would be a replacement for some hires that some pupils would currently study in S5, or is it um, an addition for those pupils who perhaps are not taking five hires, they're maybe taking one or two? Testing both of those options. So we're testing both of those. So um, a high academic achiever might want to run the, the uh, uh, work-based option alongside their core subjects and be confident that they can do that and acquire that learning and have the benefit of that learning. Uh, some young people might decide, well, actually, I'm going to swap out a hire and I'm going to take my core hires, but I'm very clear that I want to actually undertake an apprenticeship when I leave school and I want to complete the first year so I get an accelerated entry into year two on the back of doing the foundation apprenticeship. So it will depend. It will be student-centred and it will also focus on the schools and their ability to deliver. Okay, thank you. Um, Colin. Thank you, um, we've really touched a bit on measurement 
but I'd like to look at a, a couple of specific aspects of this. SDS submission to this committee uh, reports on a wide range of activities, but it's difficult to make the direct links between what SDS has spent its money on and the outcomes that have been achieved. Now, much of what's included in the outcomes section of the submission actually refers to financial and other out inputs, and the outputs from this, specific, which are specific activities or the number of starts on specific programmes, rather than on, on the success of SDS in achieving positive change as a result of this activity. I hope that wasn't too convoluted. I understand the question you're asking. So <clears throat> we report on activity impact and outcome measures. If you take the apprenticeship programme, a really good example, activity measure would be 26,000 starts. Uh, the final outcome would be sustained employment and completion rates. So for the £75 million that we invest in apprenticeships, the Scottish Parliament can be assured that they've got a five-star programme because they've got completion rates in excess of 74 to 80, 78 per cent, which are the highest and comparable to any programme. You've got sustained employment at 92 per cent, six months beyond completing. When we do surveys of uh, employers and individuals around what has transpired as a result of completing their apprenticeship, we see an increase in earnings, we see an increase from the employers in the uh, young person's productivity in the workplace, their contribution to the sector and so on. So, um, it may not be specifically in the submission, just because of the nature of what we can put in there, but be assured we've got very clear outcome measures which are aligned back to the activities that are funded. Similarly, in schools, if you look at the work that we do in respect of careers advice and, and guidance, the positive transitions of young people from schools is really, really critical. And so if you look at the outcome measures in terms of the school leaver destination reports over the last six years, you've seen a significant increase in the positive uh, uh, progression to positive destinations. Uh, we would be a small part of the contribution to that in respect of good careers advice. Clearly, the schools have got a substantial role in all of that. But right across the board, in terms of all of our substantive investments, we can track exactly where we deliver outcomes that align with the national performance indicators and where those outcomes are re real and tangible. Because remember, every apprentice is an employed apprentice. It is a job, a real job. You're, what you're saying sounds good, but of course, as you say, the submission itself didn't really bring that out. I think the, the submission seemed to be more about inputs and outputs, which don't really give a, a, the result of the spend and activity and the positive that comes out of that. Yeah, I, I just, I guess, in case of the comprehensive nature of what we can provide, but right across the board, we can absolutely align what we do with the national performance indicators, as I say, in terms of positive transitions from school, the acquisition of qualifications in support of a more skilled workforce, sustained employment, responding to redundancies, as, as we've discussed before, the numbers that we work with in terms of supporting back into positive destinations, the production of the intelligence that we talked about, um, that intelligence... Uh, in terms of spend is very low and you'll see from the submission that relatively speaking it's a small spend but in terms of influencing how the supply side meets future demand it's absolutely critical so you know hopefully that answers your question. Perhaps a, a trickier one to assess is where there's partnership working. Um, measuring success I think can probably be quite challenging for the individual uh, partners within uh, any particular activity. And I just wonder how you capture the impact of partnership working. You know, I suppose it might be a return on investment of time or whatever, and the influence that you've had and how you, how you, how you influence sometimes quite a complex partnership arrangement. It's a really, really good question. I'll give you an example of it in practice. So maybe about three years ago, we had discussions with colleagues in the Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Um, we attended the convention of the Highlands and Islands. Um, and there was a concern at the time, there was a belief that the, the future economic growth of the Highlands and Islands region could be arrested by a lack of skills, that skills could be a key block in the future growth of the sector. And we said, right, we will do a comprehensive regional skills assessment and investment plan for the Highlands and Islands. Uh, we did that in partnership with all six local authorities, with UHI, with uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, with NHS, with the Forestry Commission and so on. And what we discovered as a result of doing that work was that the number one issue 
in terms of the future growth of the Highlands and Islands wasn't skills, it was actually population. And that the Highlands and Islands has got the fastest growing population in the UK, but it's all at the 65 plus age mark. And that the outmigration of young people from the region is still running at between seven and 8,000 young people per year. And that critically what's required is an in-migration of working families. And then there's clearly a whole issue around transport, housing, uh, and, and the proposition of lifestyle that would attract uh, people specifically into the sector. And then beyond that, we looked at very granular information around each of the regions because the Murray Firth and, and Inverness is very different to the Western Isles, is very different to Shetland, is very different to Orkney. And we've now got separate regional skills plans for each of the island communities. Um, and at the last convention of the Highlands and Islands, three years down the road, um, the views universally around the table were the work was a seminal piece of work that influencing the future provision of UHI in respect of delivering more work-based pathways, because if you deliver learning via the workplace, then it anchors people in the region rather than having to leave the region and hope that they'll come back in. That the requirement for a major talent attraction strategy into the region was crucial. And I think uh, Alex Patterson was quoted this week as saying, actually, you know, where the Highlands and Islands is now compared to where it was when HIDB was set up is, is an area of opportunity. And what we now need to do is really communicate strongly that uh, the region has got a lot of opportunity and, and, and it should be a region where it, it's easier to attract uh, families into the region. You sort of described the success, but I'm not sure it really gives me an insight into how you value your input into partnership working and how you assess the impact. It's a difficult one uh, because, as I said before, very little of what we do, if you look at the size of our budget, it's not insignificant, but relative to others, it's, it's, we're, we're, we're a junior partner. And largely what we have to do is through our influence and our intelligence and our, and our innovation is bring some of that to bear on influencing decisions. Um, and, and we do that, there's nothing we do on our own. There's absolutely nothing we do on our own. We've over 12 to 15,000 uh, businesses who provide apprenticeship opportunities. We don't provide the opportunities. It's industries who step up and say, I'm going to commit to a future job and offer that job. So what do we do to convince industry to deliver that? So I, I don't know if I'm missing the point, but partnership working is absolutely central to what we do. I mean, it, we, we could not do our job without strong partnership engagement. I've no doubt that... Uh, sorry, Colin, I think Danny wanted another... Sorry, uh, sorry. Just, just, just to add to that, um, a couple of points. Uh, John, in his introductory remarks, he referred to our membership of community planning partnerships, and we are involved in all 32 of those community planning partnerships, and we're involved in all the various subgroups around um, supporting the priorities that, that are there. And a lot, a lot of that's come from the recognition that the SDS has a key role to play within those community planning partnerships, because before that we weren't involved in all of them. So that's a, a major um, a step for us to be, be involved in the contribution we can make. And there's a couple of other partnerships that's really worth mentioning. And it's very easy to say partnerships when really, when the essence is about how we jointly work together. And the schools is a very, is a key one. We've got nearly 400 school partnerships in place with, with secondary schools, and that details out the services that we provide in conjunction with the schools and how we make sure we deal with those, those particular priorities. And another key partnership we have is with the Job Centre Plus around integrated employment and skills, and that was about how we work together mainly around how we did some, some data sharing and, and, client, uh, and client referrals as well. But the other big one we've, we've talked about today, it was mentioned in some of the questions earlier on, was the PACE partnerships. There are 18 in Scotland, and we manage the 18 partnerships, and that's about bringing all the organisations together to make sure we, we, we deal with some of the PACE situations that are there. Uh, Damien mentioned about positive destinations. 92.3% was the positive destinations last year. And that was very much about a partnership uh, approach in terms of schools. The, the committee will be aware of the, the participation measure that has now been introduced this year. So we're moving from 51,000, 52,000 school leavers to over 225,000 individuals aged 16 to 19 year old who fall into that participation measure in terms of how we support those individuals secure positive destinations, employment training. And that very much brings about the key work that we play within SDS in terms of our own, the data hub that we manage and we support, supported by other partners and how we support individuals who are looking for in terms of supporting them into employment training and, and further learning? Um, I'm certainly hearing 
lots of positive statistics and so on there, but I still don't see how you're evaluating what you're doing in that partnership. Success or fail, what could be done better, whatever. The, the investment that you're making in there in terms of time, which is money. How do you evaluate that? Can I, can I give you an example, Mr. Beattie? A recent one in terms of evaluating it was Education Scotland's reviews. The, the committee may, will be aware of Education Scotland are undertaking an, a, a series of uh, careers information advice and guidance service uh, audits reviews throughout Scotland. And so far, we've had seven this year, five of which have been reported on. And a common theme coming out from all of them has been a really, a, a, in terms of good practice, has been the school partnership agreement. And they've been in, they've talked to head teachers, senior members of the staff within, within schools, talked to pupils as well and their own staff in terms of how those particular partnerships have really engaged both SDS and, um, and, with, the, and with the school. And what's also interesting coming out from, from, from that in terms of some of the recommendations, and a key recommendation that's coming out from that partnership agreement, for, particularly for schools as well as ourselves, is how do we embed career management skills, all of the developments in career studies into the curriculum, the point I made earlier on about the importance of earlier intervention. And that's been a key point that's come out from a review of a partnership agreement. OK, I'll, I'll leave it at that and move on to a different facet, which is, quite simply, how does the SDS assess its value to employers? How do you assess that? So it's um, a number of ways. Um, our ambition, working with employers, as we state in our goal, is that they can re recruit the right people with the right skills at the right time. And that sits at the heart of what we do. So, as we said before, the first part of it is, are we able to work with industry to articulate the demand and the future needs that they have? Can we then put in place short, medium and long-term measures to ensure that that supply meets that demand? And then separately, we have two other programs where we work with companies who want to invest in and grow their workforce, and we look to ensure that they get the right support uh, to bring forward those investments. Uh, lastly, we've got um, a web environment call, called our Skills Force, where we try to aggregate all the offers available to business in respect of skills in one location, so we make it very, very easy for industry. But the ultimate test will be, are those sectors in growth, and are those businesses in growth, and are their staff and their workforce contributing to the long-term competitiveness of those businesses in respect of, of, of those challenges. So we would see ourselves as helping those companies through providing the future skills and ensuring that that pipeline right across all the partners is meeting their needs, that we're challenging them also to co-invest in that model. And the challenge then beyond that is to understand, is that delivering the competitive advantage for individual businesses, for sectors, and for the Scottish economy? I guess, I guess what I'm looking for is to see what your evaluation is in terms of how you determine what the investment is going to be into different aspects of support for employers and how you, how you decide which is the most successful, where you focus your resources. Yeah. I mean, the early emphasis on responding to future needs has dominated the work that we're doing. So in terms of future skills demands, that has been the area that we focused most heavily on. Um, and in many respects, it's not an either or. We've, we've got four areas that we continually look at in terms of the, the long term. We look at what do we need to do better and different in respect of informing young people who are 8, 9, 10 today in respect of the future jobs that might be there, helping their parents and helping the teachers understand those progressions. So that inspiring the pathways around careers is a critical part of what we do. Making sure the system is responsive so that the outcome agreements are aligned with future demand. Then putting in place immediate measures through the academies. So if there's a need right today, there's no point in saying to a sector, it's going to be four years before you get a graduate. So the Code Clan example is an example of an initiative to respond today to how we deliver that. And then lastly, what we try to do is to create better connections between industry and the supply side so that in the future, we don't have the peaks and troughs that we're witnessing just now. So that's still in its early phase in respect of what of those different elements are working better. Uh, and so we will continue to evaluate that and determine is the, you know, is a direct uh, intervention like Code Clan working more significantically than actually a, a, an alternative? Katie? Katie, you want to... There's 
We've also got some specific measures in terms of looking at the returns we get from the survey of over 2,500 employers involved in MEs. So we asked them, did it help improve productivity? And 75% um, of them said yes. That's up 7% from the last survey we did. Um, it, did it help product service quality improve? And again, all these results have increased um, and we measure it that way. We also asked a question this year to look at the different frameworks and how productive people were at the start when they came in and, and how, how productive they became as part of that as well. And there's been, it's a pity Miss Scanlon's not in the room at the moment, but there's been quite a lot of um, excerpts from the Audit Scotland report here today, selective um, excerpts from it. But one of the main points arising from that was that we managed the ME programme well and Audit Scotland recognised that. Um, John. Yes, just very quickly, Chair. In further to Colin's first question with regards to your outcomes, and, and most of your submission was on either uh, financial inputs or outputs, and I think, Damien, you very quickly come back and say, well, one of our, our, our outcomes is, you know, the delivery of 25 modern apprenticeships. And that kind of takes me back again about, I think you also said that the relationship that you had with industry uh, could be significantly improved and, and, and you were unable to sort of identify for the future where the boys were because of this lack of information or a relationship. I mean, Chick did, many, uh, did mention HEV and Mary can he mention IT. And uh, which brings me back, how then, who gives you the information then of the 25,000 modern apprentices that you need to deliver? If there is this void here, right? Which then begs the question, are you meeting that outcome target of £25,000 by quantity rather than quality? And we do know for a, you know, we do know for a fact, I think, identified in the year 2020 or 2022, that we're going to be 100,000 plus engineers short. And uh, so of that 25,000 MAs, how many of those are actual engineers? And saying, how do you get to, you know, my concern is that you're, you know, you're just meeting the target by quantity yeah. rather than quality. I believe I understand the question. I'll maybe ask Katie to speak in detail, but just to be absolutely clear, we start with a buying proposition in respect of what we want to buy for want of a better description, which is a clear articulation of where we want to uh, invest in, in terms of future skills. And that's driven by the key sectors in Scotland. So in respect of the economic strategy for the Scottish Government, where do they see future growth coming for Scotland's economy? And where would they like to see that investment skills go to drive the economic demand going forward? So that's very explicit. Um, so we have got clear priorities around the key growth sectors. We've got clear priorities around STEM, which we understand will be in future demand. We've got clear priorities around specific groups of young people. And all of that is factored into an annual buying statement in respect of the procurement. So it's, it's actually a very, very detailed process. I'll maybe ask Katie to yeah. come in. So every year we use the skills investment plan information that's available. We've been using the regional skills assessment plans and we ask every sector skills councillor body in Scotland to predict the demand for MEs. Um, we overlay that with, as, as um, Damien has said, the policy overlay in terms of the focus on young people, a focus on STEM, a focus on level three plus. So in terms of the growth that's happened thus far, 82% um, of all growth in the extra 5,000 from 910 has been for young people. It's um, 16 to 19 year olds. We've had more 20 to 24 year olds with a decline in 25 year olds in line with government policy. Um, you asked specifically about engineering. In terms of that growth, um, it's up 29% on what it was um, in terms of 910, and that's 7% of all share. And I could say for the growth industries um, that, that are there in terms of financial services is up 1,700%. You know, it's 9% of the growth that we've achieved. So we could give you all the statistics in that in terms of, of what we've done. Also in Scotland, um, if we're looking for comparators, has been mentioned today, um, you know, 64% of our um, MEs in Scotland are level 3+. plus. Um, 13, 14, it was 62%, and we've been on a trajectory again upwards. That's in co contrast to in England, where it's 41% of level 3. Um, so we've got a much better programme in Scotland um, than we have in the rest. And again, as, as Damien says, we, what we try and do is match demand overlay with policy and do the buying proposition there. And we also have to respond to changes in demand in year two. Something. Just brief supplementary. Would it be possible to have a breakdown of the 25,000 uh, MAs? Can we publish that um, on a quarterly basis and right, on okay. an annual basis and too? The second thing was that, you know, the, I think it was yourself, Damon, who said that 
uh, the sustained employment rate was for six months. Is there, could you maybe add a wee bit more to that in, in respect of, you know, just how long does people, if it's six months, is that, is that the... Is well, the remember, they, they have a contract of employment that? as apprentices. They are employed status. Um, some of the criticisms have been, particularly down south, where the history of employed status wasn't there and was introduced recently that some providers down in England offer a contract of employment and then as soon as the apprenticeship ends, the young people are tossed onto the, onto the heap. So we've surveyed at six months past the completion date uh, and at that point, 92% are still in sustained employment. So they are still in a job. Um, Thank you, Kimbira. The Scottish Government, trade unions and others have been pushing um, the issue of fair work um, up the agenda recently. Now, just to ask um, how SDS have responded to the, the Cabinet Secretary for Fair Work's um, letter of guidance around um, fair work, what new priorities that focus brings for you as an organisation and whether you've been able to adapt to those uh, new priorities within your, your current budget? So there's two aspects to it. One is being a fair work employer ourselves and meeting the living wage, uh, getting accreditation and investing young people. So we've achieved all of those in terms of our su suppliers and, and, and their meeting the living wage. We've uh, progressed with that. In terms of the policy around fair work, that's an emerging policy and we're contributing to that debate uh, as we speak. Uh, I presented to the Fair Work Convention about six weeks ago, I think it was. Um, and what we were clear about was that the opportunity, I think, for Scotland is, is around the productivity gains that can be achieved by having very progressive work practices in the workplace. And that if you look at international uh, comparators, and I know some members don't like to do that, but if you do look at international comparators, then we typically lag other OECD comparators by 20% in the productivity stakes. So there's a real potential for Scotland to achieve significant growth if it can make in-gains, inroads into that productivity conundrum. Um, and the productivity conundrum could be addressed by having much, much more progressive working practices in the workplace. Um, and so when you look at the underlying uh, performance of the labour market over the last 10 years, you're left with a lot of concerns, and the concerns re relate to the nature of work and the quality of work. So what we've seen is employment rates have increased, but part-time working and zero-hour working have, have increased also. What we've seen is that the in-wage welfare bill, so work tax credits and so on, has doubled from two billion to four billion. So there's a sense to some degree that a large tract of the UK economy may be driven by low-wage, low-skilled business models that are propped up by an in-work welfare tax, and that is certainly not sustainable. Now, probably amongst the best models is the Finnish model. So Finland have an agency called Tekis, uh, their strapline, believe it or not, is called Joy at Work. And what Finland wants to do is to demonstrate that they have the most product, prod, productive workforce amongst OECD countries. And part of the reason for that is that in Finland, low-wage business models don't exist. And so labour is expensive. And so if you have labour in your workforce or in your workplace, you need to put it to good work and you need to create a culture where people come to work every day of the week with a spring in their step, with a belief... Uh, in the organization, and you get that contract, which is something about, um, I'm bringing my skills to this organization, um, I'm anticipating that I'm getting a decent wage, and that wage is going to allow me to be able to look after my loved ones, that uh, the employer is going to be concerned about my welfare and my development, but for that contract, I'm going to work my socks off, and hour, every hour of every day, I'm going to consider about the asset that I am, and how do I put that to place a good use in the workplace. Now, that requires a fundamental shift in the types of cultures that we see in organisations. The best of organisations do that, and the worst of organisations don't do that. And I think the opportunity for Scotland is to be able to articulate what interventions can we put in place that stimulate highly productive workforces so that people bring their skills to the workplace and work incredibly hard but the deal is they get looked after, they get a decent wage and they get progression and you get that reciprocal relationship which doesn't often exist.
I'd ask particularly about the, the budget allocation. You said that it was a new and emerging sort of theme and, and work for yourselves. How have you been able to adapt within the, your current budget? Is your current budget allocation enough to see through the, print, the priorities of the Scottish Government on fair work? Well, much of what we do would be a horizontal contributor to the fair work agenda. So in terms of new and additional work, that's emerging. And so um, one of the areas that I think um, will be very significant in contributing to this space will be the potential devolved powers in terms of welfare and particularly the work programme. We're heavily engaged with Scottish Government in understanding what that might look like and what the service might look like. Um, and specifically, the interventions that are put in place uh, during the two-year period of the work programme, how do they relate to a commitment to fair work uh, and a new you know, business model effectively for a future Scotland where productivity is significantly higher than where it's at now? So the point I would make is a lot of what we currently do contributes to the fair work agenda. The new and additional will be emerging. And one of the spaces where I think the significant potential is around uh, the devolved powers. You've said that SDS are contributing to the debate around fair work. Cabinet Secretary um, has asked you to lead um, and innovate. Um, how, how are you able to demonstrate SDS um, really leading the debate around fair work and driving through that change? Much of what I've discussed over the last... 10 minutes is, is the evidence around what works well elsewhere and what would it take in Scotland. Um, we believe there's probably three things that need to happen um, and we're in discussions about how, how this would come to fruition. I think we need national conversations that last for some time, which are about industry, talking to industry about best practice in creating high-performing workplaces. Back in the mid-80s, uh, Members might recall the DTI demonstrator programs where you know, very uh, successful businesses shared with other industries and businesses their success and what were the factors that might help. I think we need a national conversation that has industry talking to industry and public sector talking to public sector about how do you do this and what are the strategies that would drive it forward. I think we need to build more capacity within our colleges, universities, in respect of graduates coming out with an understanding around high-performing workplaces, and then we need direct positive action. You've spoken about the lag in productivity between this, our country and others. Is, is there an increase in productivity? Is that the measure of success um, of a fair work agenda? What would you say out as the, the measure of, of success? The measure of success will be inclusive growth, and I think that is the holy grail, and it's the... It's both the economic and social positive gains. So with productivity comes improved competitiveness, which should mean sustained employment and good wages. So the individual benefits because they get a decent wage and they get a good working environment and they get progression. And the company succeeds because they're more competitive and they can win more contracts and they can generate more wealth. Okay. The, the Cabinet Secretary has set out... Um, the the Scottish Government believe that fair workers, sustainable jobs, fair contracts, fair wages, particularly for those that face disadvantage or significant barriers to employment. Mary Scanlon's already picked up the issue of um, the amount of uh, disabled modern apprentices there are. I'd like to pick up a particular issue um, around young deaf people. There, there have been an issue around um, whether people with a dis disability um, actually feel confident to declare that. Um, but Many young people who are deaf don't self-define as being disabled at, at all, don't see that as any uh, disability. And just to ask yourself um, how, you, how you cater to that, how My World of Work caters uh, for young deaf people and how you, you would make sure that they're included in the Fair Work Agenda. We're working directly with the appropriate agencies in this space and we're working very specifically on, on supporting those people with uh, 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 
particular issues in that respect, Danny? Yeah, there's a, a couple of points to mention. The National Deaf Children Society, working very closely with them and, and with other organisations that, that support and work with young people and adults of, of, in terms of any other uh, additional support needs that they, they, may, they may have. So, for example, um, we've been working with, we, we created um, a partnership framework with uh, the Royal National Institute for, for the Blind a few years ago called Template for Success. That model has now been rolled out to include the National uh, Deaf Children's Society's organisation as well. And we're working with uh, the Scottish Consortium for Learning Disabilities and Values into Action Scotland to take that template for success. And what that was about was to work with young people with their parents and other organisations who support them, including ourselves, and how we can provide that additional support in terms of what they require, whether it's in a school or whether it's accessing employment or further education and, and training. And in Ayrshire, in fact, just now, we have a, a model as a statement of intent walking across the three Ayrshires, particularly supporting young, young, young people who have, um, who have a, an, an issue or a disability around, around, around being deaf, and how do we support them access employment, learning and training? What kind of careers advice and support do we give their parents and young people at an earlier stage as well as later on in, in, in schools as well. And linked to that, we've been working with, you mentioned um, our own particular web service called, called My World of Work, and again, working very closely with the national organisations to make sure that the content, the materials that are actually utilised and can be accessed in there are suitable for young people of all additional support needs to make sure they have that, whether that's them accessing themselves or whether it's through an intermediary like their parents or through or with, with teachers or with careers advisors. You mentioned earlier on in, in your response, Damien, to Mark Griffin's question about innovation and leading and delivery of fair work. Um, forgive me if I'm wrong, but what you seem to be saying was that SDS's response to that challenge about you being the innovator and you being leading in the delivery of fair work was that industry should talk to industry. Public what? sector should talk to public sector. Yeah. What specifically are SDS doing to lead and to innovate in terms of the fair work agenda? So particularly ourselves, um, one of the key developments in this is going to be around leadership practices. Um, and so the three components, as I said, would be conversations, capacity, and then direct support. Um, so we're in discussions with Highlands and Islands and Enterprise and Scottish Enterprise about the nature of that direct support that would be offered to organisations who would want to create more high-performing workplaces. So directly today, we have a partnership with investors and people. Um, I think last year we supported over 250 companies to engage with a direct resource to help them understand how do they now start to put in place the culture that would give effect to, to a, a, a high-performing workplace. Um, we ourselves are working around a proposition called uh, Everyday Leadership, where literally everybody in the organisation understands their roles and responsibilities and contributes to where that needs to go to. So in terms of direct support into companies, we have all of that. In terms of the living wage and the business pledge, we're actively promoting those both through our supply chain and directly into companies. Um, so there's a lot of very specific work that we're undertaking right now. Well, I I'd be interested to hear that in, in more detail. I'm sure you could write to us afterwards with some of the detail of that. But I need to move on. Chick, did you have a quick supplementary? And then I'll bring in Liam. Well, when you were answering <coughs> Mark about uh, not so much leadership, but management, I mean, isn't there a gap in terms of us training managers to, for example, look at, look at work school, uh, workforce planning, things like that? I mean, where is that done? Is it done? I think... Uh, I think there is a gap. I, I think part of the answer to the issue is to do more. I, and, and I think that's not only more in the context of the public sector contributing to more being done, but also very clearly the private sector and the companies themselves uh, doing more. And I think the phrase has been used a few times today. Some do it very, very well, and others you know, don't, don't uh, do, do it at all. I think... Uh, Scotland is a particular challenge. Uh, we are very much uh, an economy where a, a huge proportion of the workforce is working in small and medium-sized enterprises, and in particular in small businesses, where, and currently I'm involved in a couple of small businesses myself, where undoubtedly it is a real challenge to find the time to invest in, in the you might saw the development of management skills and capabilities 
uh, that uh, a larger organisation may see as just being part of, of how it uh, has operated for many, many years. So I think there is a gap. I, I, I do believe that uh, if you, in fact, look at the education system, the curriculum for excellence, I, if you look at uh, what is happening in developing people in further and higher education, uh, and, uh, uh, for example, the work experience, uh, and some of the attributes that are being developed through the education system, then clearly over time, I, and I can, won't mention individual institutions, there is a significant effort in some of their programmes to equip people to be managers and leaders I, as, they, as they come through that, uh, that system. I believe over time we will upgrade the, the attributes of our, our management of our businesses, not only the large business, but hopefully the small ones as well. But, uh, but I think you're right. I, I think in terms of achieving the, the Holy Grail, I, the management education is, is an important aspect of that. Okay. Uh, Liam? I was going to ask about some of the targets under the National Performance Framework, but I think quite a bit of this ground was covered with, uh, in response to Colin Beattie's earlier questions. If I pick up one element of it um, in terms of narrowing the gap in terms of participation between the different regions. Uh, Damien, I think earlier on you were talking about the work done with the Convention of the Highlands and Islands and that being a mapping exercise which is clearly useful but it's then what is done with the mapping exercise to respond to the, the issues it throws up. And It would be interesting to know, assuming that somewhere like the Highlands and Islands is one of those areas where participation is, is, presents different challenges, what's being done to address that? If I look, for example, at the construction sector, while Orkney College will do an awful lot in terms of delivery, still some of the, the, the training provision um, requires to be carried out, or has been required to be carried out um, in Inverness or, <coughs> or, or, or the likes. What kind of um, support can SDS, working with the Skills Council and whatnot, um, put in in order to try and ensure that that, that training is delivered um, closer to hand? in order to reduce the cost to, to, to business, reduce the, the um, I, I suppose, the disincentive for particularly a young person to, to, to go away and potentially then not then come back um, and address that, that issue of participation? It's a really, really good question and, and it's live. It's live today and it's so as part of the action plan that supports the Highlands and Islands Skills Investment Plan, we have a whole set of things that we want to work together to change. Um, it's been chaired by uh, Norman MacDonald from uh, the Western Isles uh, and it's got all of the relevant partners attend that um, implementation board. Um, we're specifically looking at the challenge of near-to-home delivery of training. Um, and so that's alive just now. And I guess it's back to the scale and scope of it and also the degree to which we can leverage more of the industry investment into it. And so there's a, there's a, a three-way uh, uh, play at the minute, you know, can UHI do more to ensure that that delivery is more localised? Can we make better advantage of the some of the distributed methods, so whether it's video or web-based learning? Uh, can employers do more? So if they've got some capacity for on-the-job training, which can work as a hybrid model with the colleges, can that deliver more? We've seen really good examples of that in respect of you know, the aquaculture around Western Isles and the growth around the uh, uh, salmon uh, sector and so on, that there's hybrid models that can happen. And then I guess the final bit is, you know, where we anticipate future investment going to come, can we start to work with the schools, industry and UHI to make sure that that provision is delivered in whatever format that's required that minimises the leakage of young people from their close neighbourhoods, either to Inverness or beyond. In terms of that, that localised dimension to what you're doing, I mean, is that borne out in terms of both the, I suppose, the, the, the unit cost of delivering anything in, in the Highlands and Islands, and particularly in the islands, is going to be more costly than it, than it is in other parts of the, of the country, certainly in more uh, urban parts. But also, I, I think the age profile, and again, you alluded to, to it earlier, the age profile of those that are looking to, to train and reskill is almost certainly going to be higher in, in the Highlands and Islands than it is in other parts. 
is the approach the SDS is able to take um, geared to reflecting that rather than adhering to um, a national programme that needs to be delivered in a national way? National priorities with local flexibilities. And for the island communities in particular, we have to be flexible, uh, both in terms of uh, the cost models, which we're constantly looking at, and maybe Katie can comment on that in a minute, and in terms of, um, you know, we're looking at shared apprenticeship type models. Is there a way, you know, how do you protect this, the importance of the employed status, but how do you also allow smaller companies to come together to share that training? So our commitment to the, the Highlands and Islands and to COE has been to demonstrate that flexibility. And um, there's no point in us being around that table if we can't respond to those flexibilities. And, and we are working very hard to do that. So we will... We'll be able to demonstrate. I mean, of the early pathfinders on the foundation apprenticeships, the majority were in the Highlands and Islands region because we know that if we can get an increase in the work-based pathways in the Highlands and Islands region, that's one way of anchoring young people. You'll never stop young people wanting to go and explore and, and you know, live their lives in, in that early part. But for the want of jobs and connecting people to the local economy, uh, the recent survey that Highlands and Islands Enterprise uh, undertook said that the majority of young people still want to stay in the region, but they migrate because of jobs or because of learning. If we can anchor those through more apprenticeships and work-based training, with the rump of the delivery being a hybrid model between industry and UHI, then I think we have a great recipe for success, but it absolutely has to be flexible. I mean lest I be accused of solely focusing on the Highlands Islands. islands. Are, are there other parts of the country where there is a, a, a specific uh, gap in terms of the participation that's requiring a, a specific yeah, response from SDS? A really good example, Borders, yeah. borders in Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, Dumfries and Galloway probably more particularly where you've got actually very large tracts of rural uh, population, not high densities of employers, not great provision or not a great wealth of provision and so there's a big challenge about how do you respond to all of those agendas. We've done a huge amount of work with North Ayrshire Council around specifically the measures that we need to put in place that respond to their local economy and the progressions and the pathways that they need. So the, the national agenda is important but that local flexibility is really crucial because people live their lives locally, they don't live their lives nationally. Uh, Gordon. And similar to Liam, when you're asking the last set of questions, a lot of it's been touched on already. But what I wanted to ask was, um, the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce identified that 27% of employers uh, offered work experience, 29% of employers recruited direct from education, and 13% of employers have modern apprenticeships. What steps have been taken by SDS to try and encourage more employers to train young people? Um, so yes, 13%, although that's a slightly false baseline because you wouldn't have one man bands necessarily having the capacity to take individuals on as an apprentice and provide the necessary supervision and training that's required there. Um, we've looked at the, the whole expansion issue um, and are developing further plans around that. I mean, there's a whole so sort of things out there. I mean, Scottish Apprenticeship Week is, is our big week for employers, um, and it's been moved forward to March this year in tandem with to, um, Easier for the School System, actually. That's been a big part of it. So we do an awful lot of promotion. I don't know if you've seen the Sunday, the, the Times this week and the Sun around the Modern Apprenticeship Awards to bring that out too. We've got... Um, with the regional and the skills investment plans, for instance, in the Highlands and Islands area, there's a there's a goal in there to increase modern apprenticeships there by seven percent. So that's about our engagement with employers locally on the ground, um, to go out there using the trade bodies, etc. And there, there's there's just a whole lot of promotion and marketing activity that goes in to employers. We've got um, apprenticeships.scot um, as our new website for fulfilling um, that, that, that sort of traffic around apprenticeships which pushes out messages and is linked to our skills force, the main employer website too. Um, the other thing around that is one of the recommendations in um, that report was around um, and the strategy was around more employer engagement in MEs and the specifically setting up of um, a supervisory group, which was to gain more employer engagement. And we certainly think that that would, um, that would be helpful. And we've already been to our board fairly recently on plans for that too. So we've got a whole kind of plan around employer engagement. 
We have seen the, the increasing number of young people moving into positive destinations when they leave school, but I wanted to ask you about that proportion of young people that are uh, not in employment, education or training. I mean, what are you doing um, to support them to find employment or take up a, a modern apprenticeship? Danny, to uh, two, two points. What, in terms of uh, young people not in a positive destination, back in 2003-04, in that represented 13.3% of the school leavers that particular year. And in 2013-14, it was 6.3%. So a lot of work being done. Uh, obviously, there's intervening years in terms of making sure that young people have that positive, that positive transition. There's a couple of points happening here, specifically from, from an SDS perspective. All young people who are in an, a negative destination, or not in a positive destination when they leave school, are all case managed. We have our work coach service, which provides that intensive one-to-one -one support with individuals who uh, are in our SDS centres locally near the strip. There are 47 centres that we have throughout the country, so there's, all, there's a very intensive case management service works there. The second second point I think it's worthwhile mentioning, I referred earlier on to the, to the Data Hub, and the Data Hub was really, and, and now the participation measure, really that, that in essence what we're trying to do there is to say that Yes, SDS is a key role through, through work coaches and through intensive case management support, but so do others, because for some of these young people, many will they'll have a number of barriers, and some of those barriers are not employment or learning related. So it's really, really important that we work in partnership with other organisations locally, and we do that through local employability partnerships that, that are a subset of community planning partnerships. So we, we work very, very closely with other partners and other organisations within the, within the, um, within the, the localities. Another area where I think we, we, SDS plays a, a key role in is the employability fund, and that's how we make sure we, we arrange within local areas the, the requirements in terms of having support measures to help young people access the labour market. And for some of them, it will be about further skills training. It will be very specific in terms of jobs, or it could be generic employability skills they need support with. And we have contracts across all the 32 local authority areas to deliver that employability fund. It's there as well. And the, the final point to mention, I think, is just go back to the data hub that allows SDS and our partners to monitor and manage young people in that particular group of young people who have not entered into positive destination. It applies to school leavers, the 51,000 of which there's, there was 6.3% in negative destination. But more, more importantly now, with the participation measure, that number expands up to include 16 to 19 year olds. I, I mentioned it before, but I, I, I'm hoping the foundation apprenticeship opportunity in senior phase will significantly increase the awareness amongst you, young people about the different pathways that they can choose. That there's an academic pathway, but there's a work-based pathway. The work-based pathway doesn't need to be less academic in its rigor, but the degree to which you connect to the labor market is really important. And what I'm hoping to see is that that will impact in upper underrepresented groups in a way that we haven't seen before. So one area the committee hasn't touched on, and, and I, I think it's, a, it's a remarkable that we, we sit here in 2015 and that our relative gender uptake in STEM and science-type careers, and particularly in engineering, is, is significantly underperforming. Um, and we've looked really, really hard at what is it that's stopping young girls in particular and young women from pursuing careers in engineering. And when we look upstream, we found out that of those young people who get a pass or a higher grade in physics in Scotland, 72% are boys. So if you're not studying physics, your chances are you're not going to progress into an engineering-related career. And so there's something really important about switching on early doors, the choices that young people make, and particularly for young women, the choices they make around science subjects, that they don't switch off physics as a subject in particular. And we're doing a lot of work with the Institute of Physics to understand what is it about the, you know, the unconscious bias that goes on or, or the way in which physics is presented or taught in the classroom. And there are very few great examples of any country in Europe that outperforms the average. Pretty much most of Europe underperforms. The statistical outliers seem to be in single-sex schools, but clearly that's not a model that we're going to move back to. But just to say that upstream... We need to think hard about how do we ensure that young people make the right choices and keep their options open. And then, as I say, in senior phase, they get a really good low-risk opportunity to test 
if it's a pathway that they want to choose. And it's really interesting, of the young people that we took on in the Pathfinder at Loughgelly High School in Fife for the engineering Pathfinder last year, of, of the young, I think it was a 15, 10 were young women. Um, and the difference in their perception having undertaken the first year of the foundation apprenticeship before and after was absolutely phenomenal. And so there's nothing like experience to help young people make more informed choices. And I'm really hoping that the foundation apprenticeship helps with address some of that underrepresentation because it's not right in this day and age that in, in areas like ICT and digital and in engineering, you know, we literally have a one to 10 ratio. I mean, it's just unbelievable that that exists in 2015. And I think more opportunities to gain those experiences earlier to bust the myths around, you know, it, it was the, uh, the National Grid did a survey of 18,000 young people and asked them what was their perception of engineering. And this was done about two or three years ago. And largely they said their belief was it was flat capped, Dickensian, dirty, male dominated and poorly paid. And that was the belief of young people about, you know, as the, the head of engineering in Scottish Power said, our engineers are the foot soldiers in the war against climate change. He said, compare that as a proposition to Dickensian, flat cap, poorly paid and male dominated. So that foundation apprenticeship, I think, could have a fundamental effect in changing the perceptions about the work paced pathway and the progression into apprenticeships. Foundation apprenticeships and how it might tackle certain groups but you know what I was thinking about was uh, one of the recommendations from the developing uh, Scotland's young workforce was in relation to the underrepresentation of black and minority ethnic groups and that recommendation said there should be a targeted campaign to, to promote the full range of modern apprenticeships so what are you doing to address that issue and how successful has it been? Yeah. We've already actually had a very extensive promotional campaign since the report um, was published. The, the issue, um, and we've talked to all the stakeholders involved here, we've got a very active ex um, equalities advisory group with external, a lot of external groups on it, is that the vocational route and this back to parity of esteem within some BME communities is very much less valued. Um, and um, being influenced by parents and, and guardians, etc., the academic route is pushed um, with the result that 65% um, of white, um, white school leavers go into further and higher education, but it's 80% in BME. So that just shows you the, the differential there. And again, there are issues about what's a respectable job. And also I've been told by the likes of Bemis, for instance, that you know, there's a culture of sacrifice now, um, and then you, you gain later, et cetera. So we've got a range of actions. We've, had, we've just had a, big campaign, we've had a big campaign earlier in the summer around that. We've actually, um, we're working with BEMIS and we've got two people embedded within BEMIS and that is about going out to various communities and targeting them and going to all the groups and associations locally, et cetera, and going out there and actually spreading the message about apprenticeships to, to try and increase the uptake there as well. Um, we've also, we're also putting a specific focus on female BME as well because that, that's underrepresented too. Um, we've also had some projects looking at that. Um, Rathbone, one of the training providers, um, that, um, ha, um, undertook a project last year for us in Dundee, and that was just basically foot soldier out, knocking doors of local businesses, and as a result of that very small project, got an additional 30 MAs from BME communities that they wouldn't necessarily have done. So we've got an equalities action plan across the four groups mentioned um, and developing young workforce, um, which will be coming out in the coming, week, coming weeks. And what that will do is establish what the issues are, because they're different from each of the four groups have been mentioned. Um, and it has been developed on the basis of what our stakeholders have told us and also the, the evidence that's available there. And it will put forward the range of actions um, that we're involved in, um, in in trying to increase within MEs. But a lot of it is based on cultural norms and societal values, which if you take the gender issue, um, that will take a long time to change. So, you know, the government's given you a target of increasing the number of MAs from 25,000 to 30,000 by 2020. Um, and given that there is underrepresentation of disabled people, people not in employment, education or training, and also people from black and minority ethnic groups, um, how do you balance, bearing in mind the budget situation we're in, how do you balance trying to achieve those numbers 
and providing additional support to those groups in order to help fill that gap? You know, one of one of the areas, for instance, and we'll be looking at in the plan is, and we've we've put a bit into government is around um, extra support for individuals, um, particularly care leavers, um, and also with regard to disabled groups, etc. And that's all part of the comprehensive spending review calculations that are going on at the moment too. But yeah, we do balance, and it will also the plan um, have key indicators towards the targets that have been set within within the youth employment strategy too about increasing the percentage of participation. And obviously, that's extra numbers as the extra numbers the increase goes up too. So there will be indicators, milestones for us in there in terms of gauging our progress. Okay. We'll have to do both, yeah. Yeah. and that's our commitment. Um, Check the Jewish supplementary you wanted yeah, to ask. Just to, in terms of tracking <coughs> government's economic strategy, one of the things that we've been, and I don't really, I mean, I'd like your input. I don't expect the SDS to do, you know, everything. Um, but in addition to the lack of good management, which is different from good leadership, we are very insular. I mean, Damien, you've mentioned the OECD, goodness knows how many times today. I mean, what can be done, in your opinion, as a skills development? One of the big things, last week at Business in Parliament, we talked about, uh, one of the presenters talked about lack of language training. Uh, how do we, can we, through skills development, internationalise you know, all of the, you know, the apprentices and trainees that we have? What, what, what can we do to be a bit more outward looking in terms of uh, those that go through the skills development programmes? I mean, a lot of it, I know, falls on companies, but... Yeah, no, I think it's a really good question. Um, and it, it's one that I often reflect on because originally I was brought up in Dublin and Ireland, spent a long time in Scotland, and there's a real s sense of um, a difference in outlook where uh, a sense in Ireland is you will not survive unless you've got an outward look and you're connected to international markets. And that doesn't feel as pronounced. And I think there's something about right through all of our activities that that core vein of internationalization is non-negotiable. So that within our school experiences that we switch on early exchange programs, language programs. Um, I think the whole digital side of things has got incredible scope. So the ability and, and the rate at which we internationalize is incredibly foreshortened through digital technologies. Folk might remember in the past, if you were looking at international markets, you wrote to the embassy and you looked for a country market report and the embassy took three months to give you the country market report and you paid them 20 grand. Then you paid them another 20 grand to find your agents. You then went out on a visit to those agents and you took another year before you could get into the markets. Well, through the internet and, and digital technologies, you can literally land in a market and be trading today. Uh, and for me, um, you know, the, the twin track of how do we get an international mindset that's a core facet of, of a Scottishness? And it's there, but maybe it's not as pronounced as it could be. And then how do we get into people's minds that actually the digital challenge has got great opportunity and threat in equal measure? If you look at all the recent research around the, the disruptive potential of digital technologies, it's going to be absolutely phenomenal. And it's the rate and pace of disruption that's going to be phenomenal. Now, the challenge for Scotland is, are we going to be a, a nation that responds to that by way of being a victim, or are we going to be on the curve and leading it? And you just need to look at the Ubers, the Air Nibs. And so it goes back to that fluency of international mindset, but actually, are we digitally aware? Are we connected to the digital economy? Do we have businesses who actually are engineered from a digital perspective and their markets are not near to markets? The vast majority of businesses in Scotland sell within a 44 mile square radius. And, you know, and our mobility in our workforce is very limited. I met with uh, an advisor to the Treasury in the US and we were talking about labour market interventions when you had major closures. And I was asking him about what would you do if the steel mills closed in Cleveland? And he said they did. And I said, and what did you do about it? And he said, we did nothing. And I said, and what happened? He said, people went to work in Florida. And that would be like people leaving Glasgow and going to work in Athens. Now, we struggle between Glasgow and Edinburgh for people to migrate and within the travel to work region. So the mindset and the digital bit, I think, would be two things that we could focus incredibly on. And both have great, great potential. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Liam? 
Did you have a question? Yeah, I'm just mulling on the linguistic challenge of moving from Glasgow to Athens. But um, I, if I can take you from the macro to the micro, that one of the um, uh, one of the aspects um, that's been uh, introduced to kind of support uh, in the development of the young workforce is the employer recruitment incentive program. Uh, it's more a plea than a than a, a question. I know that the the start date for that. Uh, we said in July this year, um, from a, a constituency example, I know of employers who were taking people on um, as they left school, which is a couple of months earlier in the year. Now, I, I think SDS have been reasonably pragmatic in responding to that, but I, I think the plea would be, let's look at the start dates and make sure that that's relevant to when it is that young people are likely to be taking up the sorts of opportunities that we're, we're seeking to promote here. Yeah, I mean, in terms of it starting in July, um, government came to us and, there was this, as you know, the, the local authorities are the ones who are actually out there on the ground kind of delivering it. We, we are administering the programme, so um, there was some work to be done on eligibility, you know, where the money was coming from, etc. So that's why there was a July start date of, as part of it, whatever. In terms of, I mean, certainly we can ask government to consider in terms of eligibility the issue that you've raised there. I certainly appreciate the time it takes to, to get everything in, in line, but I think in this instance it would have been perhaps more sensible to, to backdate it because the risk was you had people taking uh, young apprentices on and, and being faced with the choice of either ditching them and taking on somebody else uh, or just not benefiting from the programme at all, which is not a... So we can take that back to Scottish yeah. Government and ask them to consider it. That's helpful. I've got one final question um, uh, for yourself, Damien. You mentioned in just a, a few moments ago that um, this model of uh, MAs being in the senior phase in school was low risk um, for those individuals who took it on. It would truly only be low risk if the SQA and the universities have accepted that it's an equivalent tariff to hires and other qualifications that are already recognised. Have they done so, or what work have we done on that? So that, that work is on the way, and I think it's a great question, and it begs the question of how do we value work-based learning versus academic learning in, in its truest sense. And uh, right now, you know, and in the past, the, the, the system has actually worked against it. So if I'm a head teacher in a secondary school, and if the convener is taking higher maths and I'm taking a work-based pathway, then the school gets four times the tariff for you than for me. Now, you, know, you said that before, and I understand that. We all understand yeah. that problem. We understand the history of it. You've said it's low risk, and that was your exact words, um, if you take the model that you're, you've been describing of taking an in-year modern apprenticeship in S5 and S6 in the senior phase. My question is, what work has been done by SDS in making sure that SQA and the universities okay. provide an equivalent okay. tariff score. Because effectively, if that doesn't happen, I can't see how it will, yeah, how and it so will the, succeed and how it will be a low risk. Absolutely understand that, convener. And so, um, specifically, there's very in-depth work ongoing right now with SQA in terms of modelling the certification that they'll get through the work-based pathway with um, hires. Uh, and equally, there's very detailed discussions on the way with the likes of Harry Watts, Strathclyde, Robert Gordon, around how they would manage that. So it's a development program, um, but the, those issues are absolutely being worked on. What's the timeline for the successful completion of that development? Well, it's a five-year program. It's, we've received European co-finance. Um, we'll probably take the first three years to develop a number of pathways and to work out what are the elements of a defined framework which we would then set for the last two years where we see the programme scaling up. So I would say um, probably this is the first year of the programme, so in two years' time we should land on a settled advice to Scottish Government in, what, in terms of what a national entitlement should look like and what the framework for that national entitlement should be. So, sorry, when will the... I mean, <coughs> excuse, excuse me if I don't understand this, but when you say you're working with the SQA and the universities for providing an equivalent tariff score for recognition of that work. Are you saying that will be in two years, three years, five years' time? No, that should be way sooner, yeah. I mean, that's that, 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 that technical that's exercise, I don't have the specific on it, but I could write to you with the specific of when that will be available. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I thank you all for coming along this morning? That's been a, just slightly over two hours, but um, I think a productive two hours. So thank you all for appearing here before the committee this morning. Um, and uh, now that we've agreed to hold the next item in private, therefore I close the meeting to the public. <laughs>